Let's dive into how an operational application can be created using the ontology. This is the supply chain control tower. Okay. A supply chain analyst uses this app to get an overview of their network and high level KPIs, and then drill down into specific areas of concern. The data shown here is coming from disparate global sources that previously required users to use several pieces of disconnected software. The map here shows customers, distribution centers, and plants. Previously, you used disconnected softwares. Yeah, that's true. But I've made systems where it actually mashes all these things together. So, you know, um, there's no official software like that, but it's within these companies, right? Some companies hire folks to, to do customized work. And I was one of them for, for one of the companies. And I took different entry points. I actually made a dashboard like this. Obviously, it didn't look this good, but um, this, is, this is pretty cool. Like, I like the fact that they've simplified it. Because see, at the end of the day, people want to do super technical stuff and like developers want to go crazy. But at the end of the day, this is going to go towards someone who's really non-technical. They're really just there to like see what this is and do some, make some sort of actionable command. So very, very good. Let's quickly jump into edit mode to show how the ontology makes this type of complex application easy to build and maintain with no code. So now let's say I want to quickly see a more detailed view of the customer. It's not hard With to do. no code. First, I can quickly add all the information I have about customers. From the map, I want to- Ah, this, this part right here is the stuff I used to program for like that one project I was telling you about. All of this stuff, and I get it now when he says no code. This is what I was talking about. Like usually in a company, you would hire people to do this. This would be like a thing that would come down the pipeline. Right. So you make some sort of product or you buy some sort of product like an ERP, ERP system. Um, and then after using it, you're like, oh, crap, we need this one thing. Right. These guys already have this pre built in, which is huge, huge. This is like it. It took me seven or eight months just to make these uh, these plugins and widgets and stuff like that. Right. The fact that they have these pre built in already is massive, guys. Oh, my God. So huge. It's like you're you're just it's plug and play turnkey. Get in, get out. It's over, man. This stuff is about, this is blowing me on mind right now. It is really cool. Sorry. Okay. Add a widget to the left to display properties for all customers. We can search for the customer object from the ontology and add all the properties. Next, I can add information in an additional widget below about link distribution centers. Instead of a property, we're going to add an object list. And this requires okay. all yeah, of that type. mapping between objects in the ontology we've already created. Okay. okay so in okay, under okay. a minute, I've added information to this view from dozens of data sources to enrich my decision-making ability. Now, you know, to be honest, he brings up the, that you can do it in a minute, right? That's not that mind blowing, to be honest with you. Um, once these systems are built, whether I did it or somebody else did it or Palantir did it, it's usually kind of fast. It's not slow, like unless you're an idiot. Um, so, the time thing is not a huge thing, guys. It is huge in the sense that it's a massive integration and all of it's available for you to do it in a short time. Yes. But the fact that it takes a short time, not that big a deal. So don't let that like be like, whoa, right? So just stay level there. Importantly, these applications lead directly to real actions and form complex, multi-step, cross-functional business processes. This is awesome. For example, when a supply chain analyst identifies a demand gap, excess inventory or other issues, they can immediately take corrective action, such as partially fulfilling an order or reallocating <laughs> some of that stock. From there, a colleague in the distribution center can immediately see this new information and act on it. On the surface, this looks relatively simple, but under the hood, actions are a powerful building block. Every action represents a decision made by a user and is written back into the shared ontology. For example, a fulfill order action will subtract items from an inventory object, add those items to the order, and change the order status from open to filled. Actions okay. can also have okay. complex validations and security conditions, making them a powerful building block for multi-step business processes. This doesn't even require every user to be in Foundry. Actions taken in Foundry applications can write directly back to legacy systems. They can interact with business systems like email, or even talk to machine control systems, allowing applications to seamlessly integrate into existing operations. This same layer powers not only operational applications, but also advanced search capabilities and powerful analytical and reporting tools. So far, we focused a lot on data, 
and how data is mapped into the ontology to generate a dynamic model of the organization that powers decision-making downstream. In order to make even better decisions, your team needs more than just data. Yep. Oftentimes, operators rely on models to help them understand the potential impacts of decisions yes, before they make them. Get to it, man. These models can be as complex as deep learning and artificial intelligence, or as simple as logic, like adherence to standards yeah, often enough. used by executives. Fair enough. Fair Once enough. again, Foundry's ontology is the connective tissue. By mapping models to that ontology, we create a system-wide simulation engine that powers what-if analyses that were previously impossible. Users at every level of the organization, from strategic to operational, can understand the potential outcomes and side effects of a decision before they execute on that decision. What this creates is an extremely powerful infrastructure that enables organizations to treat their operations like code. Changes can be staged and tested uh. before they are applied. Yeah, the key thing to take away from this until this point is the fact that there's actually multiple things that move the process from one thing to another. And, and actually, this product is not much of a product. Instead, it's actually pretty much an ecosystem, right? So that's why this thing is so big. When you go to like a third party vendor like SAP or something, they give you a product that fills a specific need. Whereas Foundry, it basically can and probably should, just based on what I'm seeing, run your entire system that um when people are saying your operating system it's going to be like your operating system this is what they mean like it's not exactly operating but it's for an entire layer or entire line of business for your company it does everything right um and and this whole and the thing that i missed in the first part is actually they did mention that this has a capacity to do mocks now wow like there's a lot of things that they just pass in when they talk but i think they don't understand or they don't think that the business crowd would get that so mocks are huge okay what mocks are are basically you take whatever you have currently right and you run it in like a separate system and you do everything you need to so whatever you would normally do in production for example you do it here it's almost like a test environment where, or a sandbox where you just go and play around um it's it's an easy in concept but it's actually very hard to apply there are many quirks and stuff that come into play and usually it doesn't work out too well so you only have like situational stuff that you can test there but uh it looks like their level of mocking here is like super awesome because i think that's how they're running this demo to be honest secondly he mentioned that through the modeling right which could be anything from uh, uh you know like a machine learning and ai all the way to just like functional components what that is guys right is like so from a functional component it's like if if this action is taken do this or if blah 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 do blah, blah blah like if and else right if and then um so if, just think about it from this angle so these actions and then the crazy thing about this and i've worked actually i've i've used another system that does this one part that i'm going to mention and it sucked at it so like basically what it's saying is this based on this action you can potentially trigger any connected system any connected system <laughs> Right. All the system I would have to do is have some sort of entry point or a webhook. That's called a webhook, right? Or an API. Um, so as long as these actions are triggered, there's a process that runs and says, okay, um, X, Y, Z action has been triggered. Go down the list to see what other thing needs to happen. Right. You can actually like list that here. And once that's there, if it needs to go externally and go and find something else to pick up. And, it, and they were saying that it could trigger like actual machinery or something. Right. Um, these machineries, they all have like endpoints and stuff like that, or like they're connected devices, right? So you could potentially, based on a particular action, run some sort of mechanized or some sort of like non-digital process. But that's crazy, man. Like there was a there was an instance where I tried something like this with a product that had this promised and it sucked. It never worked. You have to like go back and forth and do all this stuff. And I'm assuming that volunteers definitely streamlined that process and it looks like they did. But that is crazy. And from, from the machine learning side of it, all it is is instead of doing an if and then, you're doing it based on situational awareness. So like if action comes in and it's like this and the last time it did this, it did this before. So this time based on XYZ scenarios, go ahead and do this. And there's no like input required. The, the algorithm learns on its own and uh, deals with it accordingly. Um, I got to assume that this is actually a lesser in this space just because there's not enough, you know, trial and error here. But... Just keep that in mind. That's like, that's crazy, man. For example, in our supply chain control tower, production and pricing models leverage data from raw materials and plant capacity. 
It puts out production volume and customer demand estimates based on price changes. This type of model is often used by a supply chain manager to decide how much of a given refined product to make from a bath of raw materials. Yep. We can then chain a model like this with a seasonal demand model to dynamically oh, okay. optimize the product catalog and increase revenue. It is notoriously difficult to understand cause and effect in a supply chain. When automation fails due to disruptions or simply because status quo has changed, companies have a very difficult time adapting. As a result, delayed order. We can then chain a model like this. Okay, okay. Um, the big thing here that was displayed, and this is stuff that's blowing me away, guys. There's a few things overall, but for me, like he was talking about the seasonal uh, filter or whatever. Now, that's something that I've directly worked on before. I, I worked at a place called a startup called Two Box Solutions. They got acquired by a bigger company called uh, SPS Commerce. I think they're listed, but. Um, we did this exact same thing okay so we got like inventory edi files and basically we got it and we said okay um you have your store has sells this much at this particular time we literally went down to the store level so it's like your store in this region sells this much at this time so then when you order more later you should order more of this depending on the season it was crazy like the amount of like uh just the back propagation that was used and to basically guess and do our best to predict what's going to happen like the summertime was the best where it was like oh this gas station would need this amount of ice because of previous demand and based on weather patterns and all this crazy stuff guys it's like um that i'm very familiar with so like they've incorporated that and that's that was like a whole product that we worked on <laughs> it's, now it's just like a feature within like palantir right i'm sure it's not as robust but i'm sure it's very narrow and pertains to that particular use case but even conceptually itself, it's a very hard problem to solve, right? So that's, I don't know, man, that's crazy. This is a sleeper product. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be a longer video, so I'll, I'll split it up to separate parts. But this is a sleeper product. It is multiple massive systems in one. Like, I've built some of the stuff that, uh, you know, Palantir is displaying, like those widgets and the action types. See what you guys are what if you're not technical you may you may not know this but for each click there right for each thing that that's a drop down in the in the list and all that those are those relate to some uh you know entry into a database and this database will have like multiple you know columns of data for this one thing that you're clicking and that's only that's only it's on the surface level of the product how it relates to other stuff is like you know there's there's a whole tree of relationships from that one click Right? So these actions are actually quite complex. And that's why sometimes it takes years to develop products, right? And that's exactly why if you go to like an SAP or if you go to like a, uh, you know, even a CRM product or Salesforce or whatever, right? These things take years, years to develop the core engine, right? But it's it takes so long that they start to, they start needing to uh, bring back some, you know, ROIs. Okay, so return on investment, right? So then they'll basically, a lot of times they'll let go of the people that made it because, you know, they might've been there forever. It takes years, like six, seven years to develop it. And then they'll just hire people to keep the status quo and maintain it. And that's where we're at today with, with enterprise SaaS products, okay? This foundry thing is basically combining all of them and it's like, well, we already did everything that you're doing. Like, where are you gonna innovate? All the stuff we're doing is the future. We took everything you did, we put it in one product and we're actually streamlining the processes between all those things. That is like literally priceless, right? On top of that, they're competitive in terms of pricing. They're lower actually, if from what I can understand. So like, I don't know, man, I think this is GG. This might be like, this might be like SaaS product of the year eventually. Like the only thing that could potentially stop this thing from a technical perspective, nothing, but from a business pr pr uh, perspective, there's definitely some issues. Um, price is great, but again, Palantir is hiring salespeople like crazy and they, they really need to because I got to tell you, in, when you go get into this space and you go into like these enterprise companies, they're old people, man, like really, really older folks that don't think about the future. They only think about what they knew and what kind of systems they used. So I'm almost I can almost guarantee you that for the most part, these guys will not have used Palantir or probably even have heard about it. So um, if you don't get through to them, you're not you're never getting into the company. So, 
you know that that whole sales cycle is going to be killer here i'm going to actually pay attention to that from now on i'm going to start looking into how they're improving and ramping up their sales because that is in my opinion crucial once this product gets into companies it is going to be like wildfire it's just going to catch everywhere crazy man crazy the, the level of integration in the software already from what i'm seeing is just unreal unreal and the real question the only problem is here whenever they go into these uh, companies are they going to have the actual relevant data for them to actually use this product fully right sometimes they don't sometimes they don't have the full sets they just have like what they have so they need information for all of their downstream products and all of their upstream um you know vest suppliers and vendors for them to actually use this product fully so anyway i'll let you guys sit here and chew on that see you in the next one peace